In the New International Version of the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, and chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 read, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. You are not your own, you were bought at a price. Welcome to the Lord's Table and to our Good Friday observance of the Lord's Supper or Communion. If you weren't able to access my email earlier this week as regards having on hand a glass of juice or wine and a few crackers or a piece of bread for this shared time, I invite you to get that right now while I talk for a few minutes. Now I have in my hand a previously used safe postage stamp, which will serve to illustrate a Good Friday focus that came to me vis-a-vis -vis both our Lenten song, I Come to the Cross, and the scripture that was just read. As you all know, stamps are used on letters that we send and receive because a stamp such as this tells the postal worker that the postage for the letter has been paid, whereas a letter that has no stamp on it and provided that letter has a return address affixed, just goes back to the sender. Or, failing the presence of a return address, ends up in Canada Post's equivalent of a dead letter office. Why? Because the price of the stamp has not been paid. Now, as I mentioned, the phrase in our Lenten song, I Come to the Cross, that has given rise to these thoughts, is the phrase, You paid the price for my guilt and my shame. An interesting choice of words, as well as, of course, our scripture as selected, which says that the price has been paid for us. This is an aspect of God's workings we do not often talk about. However, the meaning is clear. Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for our sins, and because of his cross, we have forgiveness for our sins. So what I have here in my hand is a stamp, the sign that a letter has been paid for, while the cross is the sign that we have been paid for. And in many a place out there where we are not allowed to go these days, there are crosses which serve to remind us of what Jesus has done. Dare I then admit that I took the liberty of absconding with the brass cross that sits on the communion table in our church for the express purpose of sharing with you today. And dare I say once again that there are probably all sorts of places where you have seen crosses which stand for how Jesus has paid the price for us. I'm sure you know at least one person who wears a cross on a chain around his or her neck, taking that cross with them wherever they go leaving me with just one more thing to say before we break the bread and drink the cup. Of all the many crosses that have conveyed to me the significance of what we have been talking about around whatever your Lord's table is for you today, those simple little wooden crosses our children have made for Yvonne and me during the course of some Sunday school class or other church program have been for us the most precious. Why? Because of the love that went into the making of those crosses. The same kind of love that Jesus had for us. So the next time you see a postage stamp or a cross, remember that it was Jesus who paid a price for us to be free of sin. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for reminding us every day of the price Jesus paid. Help us to be proud of the cross. Help us to always remember that it is your love that has given us the cross. And now grace us with your presence as we share around your table. Amen. First, I'm going to say the words of institution with which we are familiar and lead in a short prayer then I'm going to invite you to eat of the bread and drink from the cup you have prepared at home. The Lord Jesus, 
on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this bread broken, which we are about to eat, and this cup upon our own various tables at home, symbols of your body broken for us and your blood shed. Amen. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you and for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink of it, all of you. May God bless you all in this time of our Good Friday observance of what our Lord has done for us and in the days to come. Let's continue to keep each other in prayer, and let's continue to keep in touch. The Lord be with you. Such a nice little dinner party. But in the end, what did it accomplish? What does it ever accomplish? You think that by drinking a little wine and sharing a crust of bread, you can somehow reach them, make them into something better? Convince them to love each other? They're guilty, you know. All of them. They sat down to dinner with you, but really, they are mine. So you've said, many times. But you forget. They choose their own master. They've always had that freedom. And you choose to forget in whose image they were made. You choose to forget that in the beginning... When they were created, male and female, God called them good. God loved them then. God loves them now. God waits for them to come home, even the most lost of them. And I come to lead them to God. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away for a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Then he came back and he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. 
While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said, Do what you came for, friend. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to them, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and that he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. So you say that God calls them home, and you lead them back? They sure didn't follow you then, did they? And these were the ones you called friends. Dogs have more loyalty. These students of yours were courageous when faith was just words, and they could enjoy the perks of following on your heels. But when it comes right down to it, they love their skins more than they love you. Their convictions are paper thin. They're cowards, every one of them leaving their teachers and friends behind in the dark and hoping that the soldiers grab the others and not them. They're not yours. They're mine. Who knows their own strength until it is tested? And I knew how hard they would be tested. I knew that they would fail. Who knows how to be brave better than the one who knows what it means to give in to fear? I knew that the lessons they learned in that failure would be driven into their hearts and their memories like the nails were driven into my hands. Loyalty and sacrifice need to be learned, and so I taught them. By example, they will never forget that I gave myself up for them. They will never forget that I walked into the hands of death for them, that I gave myself up to show them the depth of the love of God. They will never forget that they were loved that much. They will remember, this is my blood spilled for you. This is my body broken for you. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Cephalius the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, 
This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of the God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard this blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spat in his face, struck him with their fists, and others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? They used your own words to condemn you. They took the living word and used the printed word to send you to death. They called your teachings heresy and blasphemy. They used words of life to kill. Is this not the ultimate insult to God? That they used God's word to torment and judge and kill? These ones, above all, must be your enemies, enemies of your kingdom. And so, they must be residents of mine forever. You've heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For God makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Bless them and do not curse them. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. One of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, had gone to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Early in the morning after Jesus was betrayed, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. 
Was this one worth breaking your body for? Look at him. He's a thief, taking the hard-earned money of others out of the common purse. He's a self-serving, hypocritical betrayer of the worst kind. He led your enemies straight to you and betrayed you with a kiss. And in the end, he was too cowardly to face what he had done and chose suicide. Not even you can defend this one. Even you can't forgive the unforgivable. Can I forgive the unforgivable? And is he unforgivable? By whose standards? I came to save the lost, the ones too far gone to be healed by any other means. I ate with tax collectors and prostitutes and soldiers. I touched the lepers. I'm very familiar with the company of the unforgivable. You think that they're yours. But I went looking for them, to eat with them and speak with them and serve them. I died between two thieves. I died for the thieves. I tell you now that I went to death to show God's boundless grace for the least and the worst. Could I do any less for Judas? Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, 
but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Don't you just love politics? So easily washing their hands of all responsibility. Selling out the innocent for a momentary peace. A political expediency to keep power for just one more day. The pharaohs have always been mine, ordering the death of other people's children with barely a thought. Starving the rebellious into submission. Building the peace of their empires on the graves of the innocent. The kingdoms of the world have always been more mine than yours. Admit it. These ones are truly mine. I grieve that the temptations of power cripple the best of them. I faced the same temptations they do. The temptation to buy the mob and with bread and favors to rule the world by the sword for its own good. They too are offered the kingdoms of the world in exchange for worshipping the way of violence and death. And still, there are the ones who pause to ask, what is truth? Who stop and use their powers to bring true justice, who try to rule their people and not lose their souls. The choice has always been theirs. They are no more yours than any other human being is. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the right in charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And the soldiers? 
If death and violence are the scales you use to weigh souls, then really these ones have always belonged to me. Their reason for being is dealing death, taking what isn't theirs, taking slaves, creating nightmares in broad daylight. Cruelty and misery is their profession. Not even you can redeem them. Not even you can wash away the blood on their hands. I remember the centurion who begged for the life of his servant. I remember the one who stood at the foot of the cross as I was dying and saw me for who I truly was. These ones, above all, know what it means to face death, who cry in terror in the endless moments before a battle, who know what it means to give their lives for their friends. And in those moments of fear and death, is it your name they call out to, pray to, are they really yours? Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save? If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour there was darkness over all the land, and about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, The man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. There are no innocent bystanders, those who stood by and watched. They didn't raise a hand to stop it, not one of them. They cried, but they made sure to keep their distance, didn't they? They might as well have built the crosses or driven in the nails. Can you really say that they are yours, these ones who watched you and a thousand other criminals get dragged along the streets to die outside the city walls? Can you really forgive the ones who turn their faces away and pretend that only the guilty die on crosses, that a judgment of guilt deserves its cruelty? Are these self-righteous ones worth dying for? Can you really call them yours? Even though they were afraid, they took me down in the darkness and washed my body. They lent me a grave. It was the only protest they were allowed to make. 
And even for those who watched me walk by with a shrug, I died for them. I walked for them. Every step I took was a call for them to turn and look at the suffering and not turn away. To see that the one on the cross is their neighbor, their brother, their sister. Every step I took is a reminder that not only the guilty are condemned. Every step I took is a reminder that even the guilty are worthy of mercy and forgiveness. In the end, was it worth it? All that pain? All that sacrifice? Was it worth what you gave to them? Gave up for them? They forget so easily. They forget what you taught. They ignore or twist it or rationalize it away. Can even you be so foolish as to forgive them? Can even you give grace to beings like these? Admit it. Admit that I've won, that they are guilty, and that they belong in my kingdom, not yours. Your light seems to have gone out. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and empty, and darkness covered the face of the abyss, while the breath of God moved upon the face of chaos. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who trust in me, even though they die, will live and everyone who lives and trusts in me will never die. My kingdom is mine, and the boundaries of it are not yours to define. God's grace is not yours to control or dispense. Scattered as they are, they are still mine, my sheep, for whom I shepherd. As long as one of them is missing in the wilderness... I will search, and it will always be worth it. How can you say that? How can it possibly be worth it? How can they possibly be worth it? For the same reason, it has always been worth it. They are loved. God loves them, all of them. Speaking of light, can you see it? What? Dawn is coming. I need to be going, and so do you.